Okay, um, I have changed the titles a little bit on some of the pieces simply because of where the kind of breaks in the study uh, fall once I actually get into it. This week we're going to, we're in week five, we're halfway through the course, and uh, the conversion of the Gentiles. Today we're going to talk about the first of the Gentile converts and the first missionary journey of Paul and Barnabas. And then next week, because I had a title for week six, I did have Paul Barnabas in the Council of Jerusalem, but I want to get into the first of the missionary journeys today, so I call next week just the Council of Jerusalem, okay? And then we'll look at outreach to the west, which is where um, Paul heads to Europe and begins to extend the ministry of the west. One of the, one of the strange things, really, about Luke and the book of Acts, um, and this was his commission, this is what God called him to do, but the only record we have of any official kind is the record of how the church went north and west. We don't have any record of the church going south and east, even though it did. You know, we have very strong tradition that says that Thomas went to India. We have strong tradition that says that later on, Mark, John Mark, who we'll be introduced to today, headed south to Egypt. And we know that there were very ancient churches, the Coptic churches in Egypt, Ethiopia, which may have been the result of the Ethiopian eunuch, who was an assistant to the queen, um, having been converted by Philip. We looked at that last week. Then, uh, but we really, it's, it's all north and west, no south and east. And so all we really have are traditional records for that. Uh, but the only biblical record is the book of Acts, uh, up through Syria into Asia Minor and then across to Europe. Okay? The book of Acts, of course, uh, we have to see this every week. Luke is the writer and uh, the companion of Paul, the, the doctor, the only Gentile writer of any books of the Bible. And yet, if you add the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts, he's responsible for writing over one quarter of the New Testament. So, very significant that a Gentile was involved in that. We believe the authorship was, uh, the book was written A.D. 62 to 69. So we're looking at about 30 years after the death of Jesus, when uh, all of these activities had occurred. The indication is that Luke may, while he wrote a gospel, which is the story of Jesus' ministry on earth, and the book of Acts, which is the story of the growth of the early church, he ends the book of Acts so abruptly with Paul in prison in Rome that we may, a lot of scholars believe that he may have been intending to then write a third book, which would be steps from there, but for whatever reason was prevented from doing so. And that's simply because we have such a cliffhanger, you can't believe that there's not going to be another episode next season, you know. Uh, but, but we're sort of left hanging there with Paul in jail. So uh, let me know if you have any questions, Chewy, okay? I love Chewy. <laughs> okay. Uh, purpose to show the Old Testament promises of God are fulfilled. Everything that we're reading here, everything we read in the Gospels, everything we read in the book of Acts, in fact, everything we read in the New Testament, is a fulfillment of promises that God has made since the beginning to his people. And so that's why, in the book of Acts, the, the great sermons of Peter, the testimony before his martyrdom of Stephen, the ministry of Paul and his preaching, all of them are based upon the Old Testament. And they quote extensively. In fact, we... Uh, we sort of skipped over, because we didn't do all of Stephen's testimony, because it's very long, uh, but it's all a retelling of the Old Testament story of how God, from Abraham on, and in fact, even in one case, all the way back to Adam, how God's intention is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And so, this is a book about God fulfilling His promises. And as we mentioned before, you can there are several different ways you can outline this. Certainly you can outline in more detail. But um, Jesus said, you are to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world, or the end of the earth. Um, and that's basically concentric circles, starting in Jerusalem. And then Judea was, the, was where Jerusalem was, and then Samaria was the province north of that. And then from there, you travel into Asia Minor, um, Europe, further east, further south, and that sort of thing. So that's one way we can understand it because it very, very specifically follows that kind of order. All right, let's start today by looking at a map. Um, this map, and by the way, if you go online, I think I've got these in a different order. Uh, a couple of these slides because I put, the, I put the map later and then decided as I was doing final prep that I wanted you to see it now. A um, couple things on this map, you'll see several, several lines. Um, this dotted line here, this is Jerusalem, 
Um, to give you an idea, Joppa on the coast, Caesarea we'll talk about in a minute, the Gaza down here, Ascalon. This area here is, is Philistia, the area of the Philistines. Up here is what is, well, further north is what's known as um, uh, Phoenicia, the famous you know, Tyre and Sidon, the famous uh, maritime peoples, the Phoenicians. But from Jerusalem here, this dotted red line wandering down through the desert of Judea, down to Marissa, Lachish, and then Gaza, um, this was uh, Philip, Philip the Evangelist, Philip who was one of the deacons. Here is where he met the Ethiopian eunuch. The Ethiopian eunuch was reading the book of Isaiah, and uh, Philip explained it to him. He became a Christian. Um, they came to some water because they were in the guy's chariot, and the Ethiopian said, is there any reason I shouldn't be baptized? And Philip said no, so he baptizes him. And then Philip is bodily taken out of the situation by the Holy Spirit, and he just disappears. He reappears um, in Azotus, here. Um, it said he was found in Azotus, meaning he sort of reappeared, that he jeeped. You know about jeep? Now, I'm not talking about the vehicle. Popeye, you guys Popeye cartoons? Mm -hmm. You know the reason that jeeps, the vehicles, are called jeep? There was a character in the old Popeye cartoons before the Second World War and during the Second World War called jeep. And he, he made this noise, jeep, jeep. And he had the ability to disappear in one place and reappear someplace else. Well, when the military made jeeps, they were so uh, they were able to go over such terrain that it, it appeared as though they disappeared one place, reappeared someplace else, because they could go through mud and over hills and all kinds of stuff. So they called them jeeps. I don't know why I'm telling you that. <laughs> you have a jeep. If you have a jeep, now you have a story about it. Okay. Well, anyway, he got jeeped from somewhere here up to Azotus, and then later on up to Jamnia, Lydda, and this. Uh, this line right here, he ended up, Philip ended up in Caesarea. Many, many years later, there's witness of his, <laughs> his uh, ministry there. So apparently he, this, so this line is Philip, the deacon, the evangelist who ended up in Caesarea. Now, did, we already talked about that. You know, the, the Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch and all of that. That's why I wanted to start with this. The other line which you see here, which is sort of a darker red, which you cannot tell from back there, starts in Jerusalem goes up to Emmaus, and from Emmaus to Lydda, and from Lydda to Joppa, and then from Joppa up to Caesarea. This is Peter, the Apostle Peter, and his story of traveling and evangelism. Peter initially was an itinerant minister. He, like Philip, was traveling around, ministering to people, preaching the gospel, healing people. Today we're going to start with the story of Philip and how Philip ended up in Caesarea, which was the site of the first Gentile converts. Okay? Does that make sense? Did so you that's mean what, Peter? Peter? What's that? Did you mean Peter? Oh, who did I say? Philip. Okay, Peter. Peter. First Gentile converts were Peter. Uh, all right. The first Samaritan converts were under Philip, but the first pure Gentiles, because Samaritans were half Jewish, you know. All right. Let's... Let's go here. This is Acts 9, starting toward the end of the chapter with the 32nd verse. As Peter traveled around the country, here's the itinerant ministry thing. He's traveling around preaching. He's not just sticking in Jerusalem. Now, you will remember that after the start of the Jewish persecution, after Stephen is stoned, the martyrdom of Stephen, um, most of the Hellenized Jews, that is the sort of Greek-oriented Jews, were left Jerusalem because of the persecution, and they traveled out. Well, the apostles, sort of the council of the church, which would have included Peter, stayed in Jerusalem. After a while, that sort of blows over. There's not as much pressure. You know, Saul, who was one of the guys who was really pushing it forward, gets converted and is up in Damascus and in Antioch. And so apparently the persecution goes down. So Peter and others are now free to, to leave Jerusalem, not feeling as though they have to stay so close to home. They apparently were staying there in order to be an anchor for the persecuted church and in order to, to in some ways, declare that they're not gonna they're not gonna leave. That's one of the things that indicates to us that the persecution was specifically targeted, or more specifically, targeted to the Hellenized Jews and not to the Hebraic Jews. Stephen, for instance, was a Hellenized Jew. That's we know by his name. And so most of the other examples we have of those who left the city were Hellenized Jews. The council stayed in Jerusalem and at that point were not bothered by the Jewish authorities. So we think that there was a differentiation made uh, there. Okay. As Peter traveled about the country, he went to visit the Lord's people who lived in Lydda. You just saw the map. If we had two screens, I'd have both these up here at once, but we don't. Uh, there he found a man named Aeneas, who was paralyzed and had been bedridden for eight years. 
Aeneas, Peter said to him, Jesus Christ heals you. You'll notice Peter does not claim that he had anything to do with it. This is, uh, in Peter's sermons, they are so Christocentric, to use the theological word. They are focused on Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ heals you. Get up and roll up your mat. Immediately, Aeneas got up. All those who lived in Lydda and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. The area you've heard of, um, the Rose of Sharon, Sharon was a plain, the plain of Sharon. It was one of the most fertile areas in uh, Israel. And so when they say Sharon, they mean the area surrounding Lydda, the area between Jerusalem and the hill ridge that runs right up the middle of Israel and the coast. There's the plain of Sharon in there. Okay? In Joppa, which is the, the next city over on the coast, in Joppa there was a disciple named Tabitha. In Greek, her name is Dorcas. Tabitha is Aramaic. Dorcas is Greek. They both mean gazelle. Okay, a pretty name. She was always, Dorcas doesn't sound that pretty, but gazelle is pretty. <laughs> she was always doing good and helping the poor. About that time, she became sick and died, and her body was washed and placed in an upstairs room. Lydda was near Joppa. So when the disciples heard that Peter was in Lydda, they sent two men to him and urged him, Please come at once. Peter went with them. Okay, now, now I'm, just, I'm going to back up so that you just see what, we, what we're doing here. This, Jerusalem, this is Lydda, this is Joppa. Okay? So not very far. This is probably, I'm guessing, seven or eight miles. It's not very far. This is not a very big country. Okay? Um, <coughs> Peter went with them, and when he arrived, he was taken upstairs to the room. All the windows, all the widows stood around him, crying and showing him the robes and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was still with them. Apparently, that's one of the things she did for people. She made clothing for them. Peter sent them all out of the room. Then he got down on his knees and prayed. Turning toward the dead woman, he said, Tabitha, get up. She opened her eyes, and seeing Peter, she sat up. She took her, he took her by the hand and helped her to her feet. Then he called for the believers, especially the widows, and presented her to them alive. This became known all over Joppa, and many people believed in the Lord. Peter stayed in Joppa for some time with a tanner named Simon. Now, you will notice that um, when Peter speaks to Aeneas, and when he speaks, who is, who is paralyzed, when he speaks to Tabitha, who's dead, which is kind of paralysis, he says to both of them, get up. This is the same term that's used in, in the Gospels to refer, the same Greek term that's used to refer to the resurrection of Jesus, to, to literally come back. Um, and so because of the fact that Peter is so Christocentric here, uh, it's probably not an accident that he used the same words to Tabitha to come back from the dead and the same words to uh, Aeneas to, be, to get up from his paralysis that was used with regard to Jesus coming out of the grave. You know, get up. Um, and so this is all part of Peter's very, very strong focus on the fact that it is by the power of Jesus Christ, it is by the power of his resurrection that Tabitha comes back to life. Now she, there's a difference. You always need to remember, um, and I've had people ask me before, well, if Jesus was called the first fruits, the first one to come back from the dead, well, what about Lazarus? What about the, the son of the widow of Zarephath? Other people who, uh, who were brought back from the dead. Well, there is a, perhaps to, to be clear, Jesus was resurrected never to die again. The other people, it might be better to, to, for clarity to say they were resuscitated. You know, they came back from the dead, but only to live out whatever number of years they have left and they will die again. All right? So there is a difference there. Jesus was the first fruit, the first to come back from the dead, who would, who would remain alive forever. And he's called the first fruits because that is the intention for all believers in Jesus Christ eventually. That eventually, whether we've died earlier, um, but those who are dead in Christ, when we rise with him, when he returns at the, the consummation, then we will not, we're not being resuscitated. We are resurrected to eternal life. So there's a difference there. But it's a, I think it's very interesting that Peter uses the same expression to raise Tabitha and to lift up the paralyzed Aeneas that is used with regard to, this, to the resurrection of Jesus, to get up, to come out of the grave, you know, to come up from being dead, to come up from out of your paralysis. Okay? Any questions about any of that? 
Yes. Uh, is it significant that Peter went into the house of a tanner? It is. I'm glad you mentioned that. I was going to get into that with the next part, but now it's just as good a time to do it. Um, the Jews and the Gentiles have very strict separation. We don't have any concept. I mean, even at the worst times of uh, the separation of races in the southern United States, where you had the Jim Crow laws and you had colored restaurants and, you know, colored, you know, I've used that because that's what it was called then. They were called colored restaurants. Um, and white establishments. Even then, we didn't have nearly the kind of separation that was maintained by Jews and Gentiles. Well, that separation also existed between Jews who were trying to keep ceremonially clean and those who were unclean. One of the things that made a person unclean was to touch a dead animal. Well, Simon was a tanner. What do you think he did all day long? He touched dead animals, which means he was considered permanently unclean by the nature of his work. And so, because he was permanently unclean, most Jews, at least Jews who were concerned about following the law and not becoming unclean themselves, would not have had anything to do with him. They wouldn't have touched him. They wouldn't have gone in his house. This is a precursor to the very significant thing that's about to happen here with regard to Peter's attitude and understanding with regard to him being Jew and how he relates to others and how the Jewish law is to be changed. God ordains that the Jewish law is to be changed. This started back with Jesus. Jesus who violated the, the Sabbatarian laws, the laws about the Sabbath. You know, he healed people. He argued that the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Jesus started this process of breaking down this rigid interpretation of Jewish law. Now, the idea of this uh, uncleanness with Gentiles is not part of the law. It was part of the tradition. And it's sort of... Uh, an accretion onto the law. Sierra? Um, what about people that would buy his products? Well, tanned leather goods are not considered a dead animal anymore. Okay? Um, so people wore leather all the time. That was not a problem. But in order to get the leather, you know, he couldn't go to the wholesaler and buy the tanned hides and then turn them into something. He had to kill the cows, skin them, you know, take the meat, take the hides, and treat them, which is an awful, stinky process. Through most of history, they used human urine to process the, you know, and so old vats of old urine, you know, which is used because of the chemical makeup to, to tan hides. It was an awful, stinky, messy, plus it involved dead animals, and so nobody would have, would have been, had any contact with the tanner. Once it's turned into leather and turned into some kind of goods, then it's not a dead animal anymore. It's, a, it's an animal product. Okay. Um, yes? What about the sacrifice of the sheep and the goats? Uh, in the temple, because they were dead animals after that, and they had to handle them. And exactly. Well, the, the idea of the sacrificial animals is that they were made sacred by the process of sacrifice. Okay, um, they were they were made holy before the Lord because a sacrifice to God was a holy thing, and so therefore, by the fact that that's they were done by priests who were sanctified, and so the animals as they were being sacrificed were considered sanctified, no longer an issue of uncleanness. All right. Yes. Jesus did strange things like going to the homes of tax collectors and people who were not liked. Um, mm -hmm. And so in my mind, I'm just seeing Peter as being very Christ-like in his um, willingness to not abide by those old thought patterns. Right. To, to follow this. this <clears throat> well, he's, he's got some of that, but as you're about to see, he's not quite there yet. Okay. <laughs> He's, he's okay based upon what Jesus taught him with regard to breaking down some of the barriers against being in the home of somebody who, who's unclean and therefore their house is unclean, as long as that person was a Jew. But he's still got a problem with unclean, unclean food, you know, un, non-kosher food, and he's still got a problem with Gentiles, which he's about to get over. Okay, that's the next chapter in our little story. This is, more than anything, this is just setting you up for where, where Peter is what's going on as the start of a critically important process, a process without which we would not be here. Okay? We Gentiles would not be Christians had this next episode in chapter 10 of Acts occurred. Yes? Uh, just a quick question. Um, when uh, the woman was dead, Tabitha, uh, when, when there's the part of the Bible that says that when you're, I don't, I've heard that when you die, you're, you're present with the Lord. So why bring her back? Just as a as a thing of belief? 
I mean, would she not have been in the presence of the Lord at that time? Well, what happens when she comes back? What does it say? Then he called for the believers, especially the widows, presented her to them alive, that this became known all over Joppa, and many people believed in the Lord. So, Same thing with the, with the healing of the paralyzed Aeneas. This was a demonstration of the power of Jesus Christ, of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that led to people believing in him. So it wasn't done for Tabitha's sake. It was done for the sake of the people who were mourning her, and for the sake of the witness of the gospel that was made possible because of this. You know, people came to Peter and said, "Can you, you know, Tabitha? We love our, our dear Tabitha Dorcas. Can you come and help her? Can you do something? Because we want her back." Well, um, that's not always a good enough reason, but in this case, Peter was prompted, I believe, by the Holy Spirit to do something about it as a witness to the fact that, that Jesus is real and people believe because of it. Both of these instances, these miraculous things happen as a testimony to Jesus Christ. Not to Peter, not to Peter's power, but to the power of Jesus Christ and the truth of what he claimed to be. And people came to be believers because of that. Okay. Yes? Many of the life after life after death reports where people have been resuscitated. You say that they went to the presence of the Lord and then came back. Yeah, and surprisingly, there are probably just as many that nobody ever talks about of people who witnessed hell and near, and near death experiences. That happens within, they have to interview them within two hours of the death or, or they go into a, a they were pressed. Yeah, they were pressed the memory. Yeah. Anyway, okay, let's keep going. This is the, uh, and I, I, I'm, not, I'm not advocating for anything there. I'm just saying the people who report that. There are, you, you never read these stories. You, know, you always read, oh, I saw a light and a beautiful voice and it was wonderful and I saw my beloved grandmother and everything else. Well, there are an enormous number of people who say they witnessed hell uh, and they've scared them to death almost. You know, uh, <laughs> that they don't want to have to go through that again. Scared them All right. Now we get to the What's that? Scared them yeah. All right. Now, you need to remember as we start this part that up until now, the only Christians there were were Jews that had converted, and not converted actually, that had accepted that Jesus was the Messiah that the Jews were expecting. They became believers in Christ as Jewish people. There were no non-Jewish people. We have a few Samaritans who were half-Jews, and even that was enough of a question as we studied last week, that they sent Peter and John, you know, so the two big guns of the apostles, up to in Samaria where Philip was to make sure everything was kosher there, uh, and apparently that all worked out and everything was fine, but they had a question about that. But there were no Gentiles, non-Jews, who had become Christians by now. That has to be, you have to be clear about that. The early church was entirely, earliest church, was entirely Jewish. All right, now we have Cornelius, the first Gentile convert, he and his family, calling for Peter. Peter is in Joppa, staying at the home of Simon the Tanner. At Caesarea, this is north, now let me tell you. Caesarea Maritima is a city that had been built by Herod the Great. We think of Herod as being awful, awful, awful person, and he was. But he was one of the most brilliant builders that history has ever known. He rebuilt the temple to the extent that Josephus said that unless you have seen the temp Herod's temple in Jerusalem, you have never seen a beautiful building. He built astonishing forts and fortresses. Um, Masada, you know, you know Masada as being the rock down in the, you know, near the Dead Sea that that uh, the Jews held out, the zealots held out, and finally killed themselves when the Romans were taking over. We don't realize that a long time before that, that had been a palace complex of Herod, and Herod had built, a, for instance, a three-tiered palace that literally hung out over the edge of this, and you know, how, you know, how high is it? It's like 1,200 feet or something from there down to, the, down to these 400 meters, 500 meters. I'm going to be there in two months, so we'll come back tell you. Uh, extraordinary building. One of the things he did was uh, um, Caesarea Maritima in the north became the provincial capital for the Roman army. But prior to that, around the time of Jesus' birth, Herod the Great had built a man-made uh, <coughs> bay, there, harbor there, where they, there was a, a special kind of concrete uh, that, that would set in water. And so they built exterior walls of concrete so that it was a man-made harbor you would pull into. It was the most significant harbor in the whole eastern Mediterranean. Very, very significant and quite extraordinary. Well, that became the center point for the Roman occupation of all of this part of Palestine. All right? Um, 
There's really, if you've got Netflix, there's a really interesting video called Herod's Lost Tomb, where they go into some of what Herod is building and all of that kind of stuff. They now think they have found his tomb, which has been hidden, which is on Herodium, which again is a palace that he built on. He basically had them build a mountain for him, you know, by taking the top of another mountain and then built a palace there. And they believe they found his tomb there. Anyway, um, so Caesarea Maritima, this is in the north. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what has been known, uh, in what was known as the Italian regiment. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. One day at about three in the afternoon, which is the typical time for Jewish prayer, by the way, he had a vision. He distinctly called, saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius stared at him in fear. How do people always respond when they see angels? In fear. What is it, Lord? He asked. The angel answered, Your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon, who is called Peter. He is staying with Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier who was one of his attendants. He told them everything that <coughs> excuse me, everything that had happened and sent them to Joppa. Okay. Cornelius is a Roman soldier. He is a centurion, which means he is the commander of a century, it was called, which was 100 men. Six centuries, or six times 100, 600 men, made a regiment. And then 10 of these regiments would make um, a, you know, um, what's the name for a Roman army? Legion. A legion, legion. exactly, thank you. A legion. So he's like a captain or a commander of a, of a, a company. He's a company commander in the Roman army. But you'll notice it says that, and the Italian regiment was, they, they had different names for them. You know, they would, they would, they would be the, the Caesar's regiment, and these are just, they would give them names. Um, you'll notice it says he and his family were devout and God-fearing. We've talked before about the fact that whenever a Gentile, any non-Jew, got to the point where they said, I don't believe in the pantheon of gods anymore. I don't believe in the Roman gods. Almost nobody did at this point. They did it almost as a cultural thing, or the Greek pantheon, which is exactly the same with different names. The Romans were very efficient. They took the Greek pantheon and gave those same, same gods different names, um, or any of the other kinds of things. If, if somebody who's a Gentile began to think, I think all of this is the product of one god, one divinity, if they were seeking monotheism, the only place they could look was Judaism. And as we've said, the problem with regard to a Gentile who's attracted to Judaism, the monotheism of the, Jew, uh, the Jewish faith, is that to become a Jew involved some pretty severe things, especially for men. You had to be circumcised. And as a man, that's not something that, particularly the, the, the Greek-oriented culture, that, that uh, really glorified the human body. And the idea of cutting part of it off in order to join a religious group was not something that most of them were keen to do. Plus, you couldn't eat bacon anymore or lobster, or shellfish, you know, of any kind, and et cetera, et cetera. So those Gentiles who had come to believe in the one God of the Jews, but were not willing to become converts to Judaism, were called God-fearing Gentiles. And you will find that expression all over. The God-fearing Gentiles were one of the reasons that the church grew very quickly throughout the Roman world, is because there were apparently quite a lot of these people people who found themselves attracted to the monotheism of Judaism but were not prepared to go through what was necessary to become a Jew. And so all of these people, when Paul and others started preaching and saying, you can worship this one true God who was incarnate in the person of Jesus Christ and you don't have to become a Jew to do it. Next week we're going to talk about the Council of Jerusalem where they decided that. All of these guys were just waiting for this. And as soon as this opportunity came, you know, they snapped it up and became believers in Jesus. All right? <coughs> Cornelius and his family were among these devout and God-fearing Jews. They, they gave generously to those in need. If you are in our, our prophets class, there are three things that God had against the, the Israelites in the Old Testament that the prophets addressed. One was idolatry, worshiping other gods. The second was not caring for those, those who were poor, not caring for the needs, the widows and the orphans. And the third one was just going through the steps of ritualistic religion without really meaning it or having a heart for it. So one of those major issues caring for those in need, this God-fearing Roman soldier, this, this uh, company commander in the Roman army, he and his family did exactly that. 
They prayed regularly, which indicated that since this wasn't a ritual for them, there was no, it's not like they did it because their, their parents had told them to or because it was something that was culturally accepted. It probably would not be very culturally accepted amongst the Romans. They prayed regularly, a sign of true belief in God. They gave to the poor, showing that they meant it and they were trying to live like that. And so an angel <coughs> appears to Cornelius at 3 in the afternoon, which is the time, the afternoon time of Jewish prayer. And tells him, your prayers and your gifts to the poor have come up before God. In other words, have come to God's attention. And so, um, you are to send to Joppa to a man named Simon Peter and have him come here. And the angel gives him directions. So he sends two of his servants and a devout soldier, meaning another Roman soldier who reported to him, a lower level soldier, but who also believed in the Jewish God as the one true God. And so they leave and they head out to Joppa, down the coast. Questions about that? Yes, Chris. Is there a difference between God-fearing people and proselytes? Well, a proselyte would indicate that they had converted. Okay. Uh, pros proselytism and evangelism are basically the same thing, except one has a negative connotation, one has a positive connotation. You know, we never talk about, you know, we're proselytizing, we talk about we're evangelizing, because the proselyte uh, proselytize, often proselytizing happened by force. You know, people would be forced to take on another religion. Um, and so, that's, but that implies that they actually became part of that other religion. So, in this case, God-fearing means they believed, but they hadn't joined. And so, at the Jewish temples and synagogues, and not the temple, at the synagogues, the temple actually had a court of the Gentiles, you know, the external court. And in all likelihood, God-fearing Gentiles would gather there in order to be able to talk about even though they couldn't go into the inner courts. Was, under penalty of death, they couldn't go into the inner courts. Um, and yet they would, they would hang around the outside synagogues, sort of you know, sit and stand outside the window so that they could hear things being read and hear what was being said, assuming they understood Hebrew. Um, and and there, was, there was this kind of peripheral group of God-fearing, but they had not become Jews themselves. Ron? I was just wondering about um, updating giving to the poor. Would that be social ministry? Because that's becoming a pretty big thing in the modern world, you know, to, could it be... I'm not sure what, what your question is. Social ministry, would that be the... Do you mean social gospel, uh, as no, opposed uh, to... Uh, helping people, the poor and all that, have you ever heard that expression? Um, social ministry, no. Uh, people talk about the social gospel. Often that expression has a negative connotation, meaning people think if they just do good things, then they're okay. That the point is, you know, doing good things, good works. Yeah. And so they talk about works righteousness. The point is that won't get you saved. All right. Uh, that's what social gospel. The social gospel means somebody says, well, I'm a Christian. You know, I I tithe. I take care of people. You know, we give. You know, uh, one afternoon a week I work at the local soup kitchen, etc. That's not what it means to be a Christian. What it means to be a Christian is to accept Jesus. Yeah. That kind of activity. With Right. But a true Christian should be doing this. I mean, that's not what makes you a Christian. That's not what saves you. But if you truly are a believer in Jesus, you should be doing that. And that's the description, I think, of he's not a Christian, but uh, that against all of his social you know, uh, orientation, everybody around him, the culture he came out of, what his background was, Cornelius and therefore his family, were worshiping the one true God, the God of the Jews. And, and as a reflection of their wanting to be the right kind of people, they also were caring for the poor. There's no indication here that that's, they thought that's what God by, you know, or that that was the point. But that is, as is, you know, the angel tells them, your, your faith, your prayers, your good works, in other words, your faith, and as well as the activities you pursued, um, have brought, your, brought you before the attention of God. And those are good things. There's nothing negative in that. Yes. Well, one thing that's interesting along those very lines is, you know, you always hear about Sodom and Gomorrah and the uh, immorality and why they were destroyed. You can go into other scriptures, not right where it describes that, and, it's, and it specifically says that your injustice to the poor was one of the reasons why God destroyed you. Right, and that, again, that's one of the three things that the prophets say over and over and over again. The reason God is angry at them is because they are supposed to care for the widow and the orphan and the foreigner. Um, and they're not doing it. Uh, they're, in fact, they're, they're getting rich themselves on the backs of those people by paying them less than they should pay them. You know, and whenever I hear somebody here trying to figure out a way they can get away with paying their mates less, 
you know, somebody who protested because, well, you can't pay the maid at the church that much because she works for me and therefore, you know, I will have to pay her that much. I, I hear that and I go, uh, <laughs> look at the scripture. You know, what does it say um, about paying a fair wage? That's part of what this whole thing is about. Okay. Um, okay. Peter's vision. Now, Peter's in Joppa. We're going back and forth now between Caesarea and Joppa, which is south. About noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. He's up on the mirror door. Okay, that's to give you an idea when it's say going up on the roof. The houses in the, in the Middle East at that time were made very much like the houses here. They had mirror doors. Um, he became hungry and wanted something to eat, and while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven open, and something like a large sheet, or sailcloth is another way we could translate that, um, like a big canvas piece of fabric. He saw heaven open, and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals, as well as reptiles and birds. Then a voice told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and immediately the sheep was taken back up into heaven. The Jews had very strict code. If you go back to Deuteronomy and the section of Leviticus, it will tell you a list which birds you could eat, which birds you couldn't eat, um, which animals you could eat. The animal had to chew its cud and have a cloven hoof. Well, pigs, for instance, have a cloven hoof, but they don't chew their cud. Um, you could eat certain, you know, uh, most lizards or snakes, snakes especially, you could not eat. Um, very strict observations as to what was acceptable, clean and unclean, in the kosher laws of the Old Testament. Now, Peter has a vision with the voice of God telling him, everything's clean now. This is a major change. Along the line of Jesus saying the, the Sabbath is not what you guys think it is. One of the Ten Commandments was observe the Sabbath and keep it holy. And yet Jesus said, you guys have got it wrong. The point isn't follow the rules and you'll be okay. The point is there are certain rules that were put in place for the sake of people. Man, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Peter's getting the same kind of instruction here, and he's kind of shaken up about it. This is to prepare him for what's about to come next. The idea that all things are clean now, Peter. All animals are clean, and maybe all people are clean. Right? Again, the fact that he's staying in the house of Simon the Tanner indicates he already was leaning that way a little bit. Now he has a vision where he hears the voice of God. And then we get Peter welcoming Cornelius' servants. Now, Cornelius' servants were all Gentiles. While Peter was wondering about the meaning of this vision, and it actually says he was puzzled in, in uh, this one translation, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. They called out, asking if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. You'll notice they're outside the gate calling out. Because they knew, as Gentiles, they were not supposed to go into a, you know, even the yard of a Jew. They didn't open the gate, walk up the sidewalk, and knock on the door. They're standing outside on the sidewalk, well, dirt path, whatever it is, calling out to see if Simon Peter is there. While Simon was still thinking about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you, so get up. Go downstairs and do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. Peter went down and said to the men, I'm the one you're looking for. Why have you come? The men replied, We have come from Cornelius the centurion. He was a righteous and God-fearing man. He is a righteous and God-fearing man who is respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told him to ask you to come to his house so that he could hear what you had to say. Then Peter invited the men into the house to be his guests. You see what just happened there? It's one thing for Peter to go into the house of a Jewish man, Simon the Tanner, who was being considered unclean. I mean, that was stepping a little bit. Then God gives him a, a, and repeats a clear vision that all animals are now clean. And then these men are, men are standing outside the gate saying, we come from 
and the Spirit told Peter to expect them and, and to, do, to go with them, to do what they asked because the Holy Spirit had sent them. And Peter hears that they come from a Roman centurion, a Roman soldier, who, even though he's Roman, a Roman soldier, he's righteous and God-fearing and respected by the Jewish people, and an angel told him to send them to come and get Peter, to come to his house. And what does Peter do? He invites these Gentiles to come into the home as his guests, the suggestion being that they come in to spend the night. No Jew would have done that up until now. No Gentile would have been allowed in a Jewish home. No Gentile would have come into a Jewish home unless they were invited in this way and had a sense that God was doing something unusual here. Yes, Rich? Yeah, it's amazing <coughs> how the Holy Spirit orchestrates all these different scenes and he puts all that together. Correct. Because he's got a plan and, and they're just following it one scene at a time. Right. It's amazing. Exactly. And it's there's this parallel thing going on. You know, two days earlier, God had sent an angel with a vision and directions for Cornelius. And so Cornelius sends his people. And it's probably a 10-hour trip from, you know, if you go pretty steady, from Joppa to uh, from uh, Joppa to Caesarea. And so they would make a two-day trip up. Because walking for 10 hours, okay, so they would, they, it would be a two-day trip. So Cornelius has this vision. He sends his servants. Two days later in the afternoon, Peter has a vision, starting about noon and then early, and just about the time he's had the vision, is thinking about it, these guys show up at his gate, and he brings them in, and then, so you've got this, and then you'll see that, that um, Cornelius and his family and close friends, those who are close to him, are getting ready for this. There's a preparation going on. So you've got them. You're exactly right, Rich. The Holy Spirit is orchestrating different pieces of this you know, in different places with different people, all of it to come together in one place to make his will known. All right? Questions? You see see where this is going, why this is so important for us. And then Peter visits Cornelius. The next day, Peter started out with them, and some of the believers from Joppa went along. The following day, he arrived in Caesarea. So, second day of a two-day trip. We The indication is made later on, because this story gets retold in Peter's words, later on when Peter is explaining this to the council in Jerusalem, when he's explaining it, not at the, the event, but when he's explaining it to the other apostles. And in that case, he tells us that there were six of the others from Christian believers, Jewish Christian believers from the church who went along with him. So there's six of the people from the, the Jewish Christian church, and Peter, the two servants, and the, um, the devout soldier who's gone along with him. Okay? The, the following day, he arrived in Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence. But Peter made him get up. Stand up, he said. I am only a man myself. Again, Peter's focus is not on Peter. It is on the fact, and in fact, he prevents, as Paul does later, Paul and Barnabas, he prevents people thinking he's more than just a man that God has called. While, people, while talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. He said to them, You are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. Peter understands that the vision he had of all of the animals that were no longer unclean or impure... God gave that to him as an understanding that there are no people who, because of race distinctions or whatever, are impure or unclean. Those divisions are now gone. So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. May I ask why you sent for me? Cornelius answered, Three days ago I was in my house praying at this hour at three in the afternoon. Suddenly a man in shining clothes stood before me and said, Cornelius, God has answered your prayer and remembered your gifts to the poor. Send to Joppa for Simon, who's called Peter. He is a guest in the home of Simon the Tanner, who lives by the sea. So I sent for you immediately, and it was good of you to come. Now we are all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. Gentile household. Gentile Roman centurion. Gentile family members, Gentile friends. Peter, a Jew, but a follower of Jesus, and six other Jewish Christians who were there with him. 
This is the scene for the conversion of the first Gentile Jews. <coughs> and after being asked to speak, Peter does so. Then Peter begins to, began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism. When are we going to learn that lesson? God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all those who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. The story of Jesus has spread a great, a great distance here. You know, throughout Galilee, remember, there were people coming from all over, from long distances away, to be healed by Jesus. A great furor. I mean, as a Roman centurion, somebody who is part of the Roman military, knowing all that went on in Jerusalem during the time of Jesus' trial and, and crucifixion, they would have almost certainly been aware of that. And Peter suggests here that they, they would have known about this Jesus, and of John. Remember, people were going out from everywhere. Uh, the Jews were going out to John when he was preaching. So Peter's reminding them of the whole setting here, um, talking about both John the Baptist and then Jesus. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. This is the testimony of the apostles over and over and over again. We are witnesses. We saw it. We were there, and we experienced the resurrected Jesus. We saw all the miracles. We saw the whole thing. I'm a first-hand witness to this. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a cross. But God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Again, focus is entirely on Jesus. And all the prophets testify about him. There is that hearkening. Now he's talking to Gentiles now, so he doesn't go back and say... Well, you know about Abraham, and you know about Isaac and Jacob, and you know about Moses, and you know about the Exodus, all the things that they do when they're talking to Jews. He does not go into that kind of detail, but he does refer to the fact that the Jewish prophets, that they would have been aware of, because remember, they're God-fearing Gentiles. They've been listening to the stories that, that point toward the belief in one God from the Jews, but they don't have as much of that history and training and background, so he doesn't go into that detail. But the story is the same. We are witnesses that Jesus Christ performed miracles, he was hung on a cross, but he was resurrected, and he has been glorified. Uh, God has, been, has made him be seen again, all right? This is the gospel. This is the gospel message. This is the good news. And it's being shared in a Gentile home with a group of Gentiles. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. Hmm. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter said, Surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water. They've received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. While Peter is preaching, they come to believe that this is true. In effect, they accept, it doesn't, doesn't say that here, but the clear indication is they accept that what he's saying about Jesus is true. They accept Jesus. And, as a result of that, they receive the Holy Spirit. Now, we've talked in some classes before, uh, there are some churches who believe that in order to be a Christian, you have to speak in tongues. That's not biblical. Paul very clearly says in places, not everyone is supposed to speak in tongues. Everybody who believes in Jesus receives the gift of the Holy Spirit, but the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the manifestation that is evident, uh, differs from person to person, and not everyone will speak in tongues. But whenever there's a situation where God wants everyone present to recognize that God is there, that the Holy Spirit is active, the Holy Spirit is, is present with them and moving, He uses the most visible, the most audible, the most obvious of the gifts of the Holy Spirit as an indication, and that is speaking in tongues. 
And so it is manifest here as it had been in Acts 2 on the day of Pentecost. Um, if they had all been given the gift of hospitality, it would not nearly been nearly as obvious. Maybe they all jumped up and wanted to serve coffee all at once, but so I'm not sure what it was. So this is the gift that everyone can see and hear and know is a sign of God's presence. And it's the one that the apostles had experienced as a miraculous sign on the day of Pentecost. So once they've received the Holy Spirit, they have accepted Jesus, Peter does the very sensible thing of saying, well, if they've already received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, there is nothing to indicate to us that we shouldn't baptize them with water. Clearly God has blessed them. Who are we to deny that of them? In fact, that's the argument he makes later when he's telling the story again. He says, once I saw that God had accepted them, who was I to reject them? And say so they couldn't be baptized with water. Um, and you will remember that it was John the Baptist who said, I baptize you with water. He who comes after me will baptize with fire and the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, the evidence of the Holy Spirit, was a sign of Jesus' presence. Okay. Questions about that? I'm going to stop there. That, that you guys, if you ever have questions, there's no such thing as a, as a bad question. Um, if you ever wonder about terms that I say and you don't know what they mean, then please ask. For instance, I got asked at the break, um, what is a Gentile? And is that somehow related to somebody who is genteel, which you spell the same way, you know, meaning kind and generous, whatever. A Gentile is somebody who's not Jewish, period. Okay? In, in, in the Jewish sort of economy of things, there were two kinds of people. There were Jews and Gentiles. Now, there are places in Scripture where they actually use the word Greek instead of Gentile. You know, to the Jew first and also to the Greek some translations say. Well, they actually mean Gentile, because the dominant culture over here was Greek, and so often, just like we talk about Hebraic Jews, the ones that were very Jewish, and the Hellenistic Jews, the ones that were more Greek, they thought of those as being the two cultures. And so sometimes they would say Jew and Greek, but they mean Jew and Gentile. A Gentile is simply someone who was not Jewish. Um, who was not Jewish? <laughs> um, and, and also I had a question about kosher. You still see kosher today, the kosher is simply a one-word uh, definition for the Jewish dietary laws. Again, in the Old Testament, especially in Leviticus, they have specific lists of what you can eat and what you can't eat, how you eat it. For instance, you could not eat a kid or a baby goat boiled in its mother's milk. And for that reason, they developed in the kosher law that you cannot have dairy and meat together for fear that that might break that law. And in some very orthodox uh, Jewish households today, because you can't mix some foods, they'll have two sets of dishes and two sets of pots and pans. So that they make sure that they, they don't, you know, and they, they cook anything that's dairy-based in one set and anything that's meat-based in another, so they don't cross over. When you read something like kosher salt or kosher whatever, it's, well, kosher, like a, a kosher hot dog is one that doesn't have any pork in it. It can only have beef in it. And anything that's labeled kosher also has to be prepared at a facility that has been reviewed and approved by a specially trained rabbi so that there is no danger of any kind of contamination from anything that would not be okay with the Jewish dietary laws. So when you say kosher salt, that means it's prepared in a facility where they don't prepare anything else or there's no danger of any cross-contamination and they follow very specific rules in how it's made. Um, and that's true with anything kosher. So it's both the ingredients and also how it's prepared. We'll be back here first and then you, Lynn. Um, this, I, I wanted to make a comment, but it has nothing to do with kosher hot dogs. Okay. Um, you know, when you, when you look at Peter and, and, and him walking, you know, to, to Caesarea, uh, it, it's easy to overlook the courage that he had. Can you imagine every step he's taking, he's thinking, I'm going to be in trouble when these guys back home hear about this, you know. And then he's, he's there, and a group come from Jerusalem, they hear about it. And he goes back and he's thinking, I'm done. This is going to be the first church split in the history, you know. And he gets there, and these guys, their, their attitude is when they hear him at first, they don't shake his hand, they don't greet him, they're offended at him, you know, because of what he said. But then, he, they listen to him, and it's like, it's like they say, well, I guess God's doing something fresh that yep. we just have never seen before. And when you look at the courage of Peter, and you look at these men willing 
to evaporate centuries of tradition because of what experience the Peter, what happened to Peter, right. and how it opened the door of the Gentiles. I'm amazed. I'm just staggered at the courage of these men who faced their own traditions and were willing to put right. them aside for what they just recently discovered by the Holy Spirit. And it did require, after all, uh, visions of angels and words from God from, you know, signs from heaven and various other things. But you're right, it still took a lot. And I'm going to address that briefly in just a second. Lynn? Just a comment again about kosher. I happened to be flipping through the TV and they were talking about kosher salt, how it's made. And the salt that we get at our table, they take it, it's already processed and refined and clean it up. <coughs> then they take it to another building, the same salt, and they reprocess it and re-clean it. And believe it or not, there are impurities that are removed. Yep. And the grains come out a different size, etc. Right. And this is the kosher salt. So exactly. And that facility has to be approved by a kosher rabbi. Mm -hmm. Okay, I don't want to go on a long time about this. Uh, but it's back here first, Rich. Yes. Yeah, uh, the, the, most people don't know it, but there's a lot of foods on the market that have a special little symbol on it that, that indicates that it's kosher. And, right. and if you, unless you're Jewish and you never look for the symbol, you wouldn't even know it's kosher. Right, and I love the fact that the, the Hebrew Franks, you know, they say, uh, we, uh, we, uh, something about higher power, we respond to, we're, we're obliged to a higher power, whatever, meaning they follow the, the laws of God, they think. Rich? Why does it seem like every time they mention a centurion in the New Testament, he's always God fearing because it, it's over and over. It's repeated. Yeah. Well, the only time the only it's the only time they mention Roman soldiers at all is either a bad situation or a good situation. So the times we notice it is when you know, uh, for instance, the Roman soldiers who are guarding the tomb or you know whatever. Um, but yeah, we, we do have several instances of the centurion at the foot of the cross. You know, he said this 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 must be the son of God. So, yeah, we do get that indication. Okay, let's keep going. Now, the start of chapter 11, to what you were saying, John, um, Peter goes back and he tells the, the rest of the church what's going on. And he immediately, the, it says that they had heard that he had been associating with these Gentiles, and the first thing it says is the circumcised believers say to him, and some people read that and think that those are the same people who later kick up a fuss and say, you Gentile believers in Jesus have to be circumcised. Apparently it's not. All they're saying there is the Christians. They were all Jews, so they were all circumcised believers at that point. They question Peter and say, what's going on? You know, have you messed up? Tell us about this. And Peter, in his own words, in the first 18 verses of the 11th chapter, he goes through and he tells the whole story again. Well, I'm not going to go through all that again because it's basically the same story. At the end of it, they go, okay, you know, sounds right to us now that you've explained it. Now, that's why we don't think that's the same group as comes up later in the 15th chapter when we look at the Council of Jerusalem because those guys are, are adamant. In fact, they're so, they're so uh, adamant that they become a huge problem for the Apostle Paul later. And Paul ends up writing those who would insist on circumcision, may they be emasculated. In other words, yeah, cut everything off. That they're so awful. Okay? So he's, he responds very vehemently. <laughs> that does not appear to be who is talking in the first part of chapter 11. But you might want to go back and read it because it's Peter's own retelling of what we just looked at. Okay, But let's go on to chapter 19, which is the start of the first church that is a predominantly Gentile church. Now those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch. Now on the map... Phoenicia is the northern, north of Caesarea, again, Tyre and Sidon, those cities that are north of the Sea of Galilee, on the coast. Cyprus is the island of Cyprus, where Barnabas was from. Okay, Barnabas was a Cypriot. He was from the island of Cyprus. And then later he and Paul go back there, we're going to look at. And Antioch, Antioch, um, north of, Antioch of Syria. It was in Syria. It was the third biggest city in the Roman Empire after Rome and Alexandria. Major city. It was where uh, Paul and Barnabas ended up making sort of their base of operations later on. So these, these Hellenistic Jewish Christians have spread out after the martyrdom of Stephen when they're being persecuted by Saul and others, and we read, spreading the word only among Jews. So they were evangelizing everywhere they went, but they were, they were Jewish believers, and so they were only talking to Jews when they went. Again, because... Apart from the story we just read, there was still a sense in which Jews and Gentiles did not intermingle. Or interspingle, as Carolyn says. 
Um, some of them, however, men from Cyprus, that's the island of Cyprus, and Cyrene, which is Libya, North Africa, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also. Here's an example where they use the word Greek instead of Gentile. It means the same thing. To Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. So these are Gentile people who are becoming believers. The news of this reached the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. Now remember, when the Samaritans, who they really had a problem with, you know, they didn't necessarily have a problem, a huge problem with Gentiles, because there were a lot of them. But the Samaritans they had a huge problem with. They were considered heretics and half-breeds. So they spent, they sent Peter and John to check it out when Philip is, is evangelizing the Samaritans. In this case, when Gentiles start getting saved, and they've already heard from Peter that this is okay. Peter's already described that he's had a vision from God that this is okay now. They don't send Peter and John or, you know, or a, a bunch of the apostles up, but they do send one of the most important not, well, non-early apostles. He's later on called an apostle. Barnabas, the son of encouragement. It's been said that Barnabas had the biggest heart of anybody in the New Testament. He was a good man, and he's always ready to put somebody else up front and not take credit himself if it honors God. So, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. Barnabas means son of encouragement. That's what his name means. Um, when he arrived and saw what the grace of God had done, he was glad and encouraged them, true to his name, encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. They were already converting Gentiles to believe in Jesus when he goes up there. Just his good nature and his kindness and his encouragement caused even more people to become believers. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. Now, it's believed that Christian initially was a derogatory term, okay? Um, it's like in England, they have an expression, Christer, which means somebody who follows Jesus. It's not considered a very nice thing. But it's believed that Christian originally was, but it's also true that it was fairly consistent. The people who were of the political party of Herod were called Herodians. People who, were, who saw themselves as being linked primarily to Caesar were called um, Caesareans, literally, you know, believe it or not. Um, and so the idea of Christians being the followers of Christ, it's not that unusual, but initially it's believed that it was used as a derogatory term. It has been about seven years since we last heard anything about Saul, and we don't know exactly what he was doing during that time. There's an indication from his writing in Galatians and elsewhere that during this time he was perhaps uh, preaching and ministering in Cilicia, which is sort of north and around the corner in the eastern Mediterranean. Um, and other areas, Cilicia was where Tarsus was located, That's, uh, Tarsus was his hometown, that's where Saul was from originally. Um, there's an indication later on, he talks about all the punishments that he has endured. It's believed that some of those punishments occurred during that seven or eight year time period, between the last time we heard about him and now, because we know of no other place. Once we start hearing about Paul, in fact, this is the place where with, with, there's some more additional reference to Peter, but we now are beginning to turn a quarter, and the focus is going to be much more on Paul from this point on, uh, with a little bit of interaction with, with Peter, with his arrest and, and whatnot. But, um, so Paul is ministering. We believe he had undergone some of the torments and tortures and persecutions. Um, apparently, he also was disowned by his family during this time, which is a very customary thing for a Jew who becomes a Christian, even today. I have good, good friends who are Christians, who 30 years ago, when they became Christians, were thrown out of the house and they've never been reconciled with their families uh, because their families refuse. It's not because they don't want to, it's because their families won't have anything to do with them after that. So it's a huge price to pay. Um, so Barnabas, who is special envoy from the council in Jerusalem, he's kind of the you know, head dog now in Antioch. He could sort of be the local bishop and sort of coast, and what does he do instead? He goes looking for Saul, who eventually will displace him as the person who is, who is most focused on and most recognized and most credited with the ministry that, that leads out from Antioch. Okay? I have a question. Do we yes. know any of the history or the background of Barnabas? Or does he just show up as a believer from 
Sorry, the first reference that we have to him is right before the story of Ananias and Sapphira. It says that Barnabas, who was a Levite from Cyprus, means he was of the, he was of the family of Levi. Okay. Um, he was not a practicing priest, apparently, because there were too many, too many Levites for everybody to be a practicing priest. But he was of that family, so he was fully Jewish. Um, he was from the island of Cyprus. He appears, his very name, you know, that's he, Barnabas wasn't his, his actual name, uh, and it's escaping me right now, I'll think of it later. Um, but it means son of encouragement, which was a reflection of his personality, it was a reflection of his character. He very quickly became, it's kind of a hero, you know, one of the most beloved of all the people. He is introduced there as the right example because it says he sold a piece of property that he had, and he brought the proceeds and gave it to the church. Well then, right after, which is the right way, he did it the right way, then right after that you have the story of Ananias and Sapphira who lied about it, did it the wrong way, and, you know, God nuked him, and keeled over dead. Um, so, but that's, that's where he's introduced, and then he comes in here, and then we have the first missionary journey uh, with Paul and John Mark, and then the second missionary journey when Paul takes uh, Silas and heads overland, and Barnabas takes John Mark again, and they go to the island of Cyprus. And... He's referred to later in Paul's letters, but we don't have a lot more detail after that. Yes? I think you mentioned before that Barnabas was uh, just the right guy to uh, vacate the, the Jews, the uh, council in Jerusalem, and introduce Paul. Absolutely. Yeah. There, there, when, he, when Paul <clears throat> was still Saul, and Barnabas was the one that took him to Jerusalem to introduce him and say, this guy's all right. There's probably nobody else, or at least we can't think of anybody else, we don't know of anybody else, that would have been as readily believed when they gave, giving a reference for Saul, who had persecuted the church, than Barnabas. But if Barnabas vouched for this guy, then they'd listen. If it had been somebody else, you know, even Peter, for heaven's sake, if Peter had vouched for him, they'd say, Peter, you're always shooting off your mouth. You get things wrong a lot. And maybe you got this wrong too. Barnabas, they were willing to listen to. Florida. What was the purpose of their names being changed? Well, typically a, a name is changed uh, as a marker for a significant life change, especially a significant spiritual life change. You'll remember Abram became Abraham, Sarai became Sarah, um, Saul becomes Paul, um, Peter, what's that? Barnabas received a new name as well. Simon became Peter. <coughs> now, and that, that tradition continued in the Catholic Church, at least. Uh, not just, I mean, when somebody, you'll know when, a, when the Pope becomes Pope, they change their name. Okay. Well, when anybody takes holy orders, like if they become a monk, they, they change their name. For instance, I had a friend named Paul Ford who became a monk. He was a monk for years and years and years and then left the monastic life. And when he, his name was Paul. When he became a monk, they, they, called, they renamed him Brother Peter. And he went, I always thought, wasn't Paul good enough? <laughs> you know? um, and so, and, and the Catholic Church, in fact, if the Hansons were here, did, did, did any of you grow up Catholic? Okay, were you given a new name when you were baptized? No, but a confirmation, you took, you yeah. took a name. Took exactly, a name. exactly. You know, you get a new name when you were, I say baptized, you're baptized as a name, but when you're confirmed is what I was thinking of. Um, and typically, if somebody's Catholic, and when they're confirmed, they have a, they have a confirmation name to mark that event. Um, and so, yeah, that's that's a sign of a major change. Chris, first? Yeah, I have a question about the Hellenized, well, I guess they were Hellenized Christians. They were Jews. Yeah, Hellenized, yeah, Hellenized Jews who became Christians. Christians yes. right. But I think you'd said earlier, the time of Stephen, that it was the Hellenized Christians who were persecuted. Right. Not. Well, well, why did they persecute them and not the Jewish Christians? What well, the there? indication was that um, th there were always struggles between the Hellenized Jews and the Hebraic Jews. Mm -hmm. It doesn't actually say in, in Acts only the Hellenized Jews were, were um, persecuted. persecuted. Right. But it started with Stephen. <clears throat> Everybody we know anything about that left Jerusalem under the persecution had a Greek name. The, the, the Jews that were the Hebraic Jews, including the whole leaders of the movement, stayed in Jerusalem, and they weren't hiding in Jerusalem. You know, they were still preaching and teaching, gathering in Solomon's colonnade at the temple. They were not being persecuted. So you add all those pieces up, and scholars s indicate that apparently the Jewish authorities in Jerusalem had chosen or decided, maybe because Stephen's the one that set this thing off, and he, he has a Greek name, 
and that their persecution was going to be against the Greek or the Hellenized Jewish believers, not against the, uh, the Hebraic, the ones that had names like Peter, you know, or, or John, or whatever, which are Jewish names. Uh, again, that's a, that's a, uh, scholars have determined that based upon all the little pieces that seem to indicate that those who didn't have Greek names were not being bothered, okay? At least if, not by the Jewish authorities here. Later on, here at Agrippa, it was evident. In the back first, in the Caroline. I was just going to say, I believe I read somewhere that Barnabas' real name was Joseph. Was yeah, it was, Joseph was part of it. There was a yeah, longer was name than that. It was Joseph of Cyprian. Okay. The Cyprian. They called him Joseph uh, from okay. Cyprius. Yeah, well, it's, Cyprus. it's a Cyprian. He's a, from Cyprus. Yes. Okay, good. Carolyn, did you? Yeah, I was just going to say, it, doesn't it seem like that the persecutors were the Pharisees more than the... Well, and, interestingly and they, enough... And they would, they would already be kind of have some antipathy toward them. Exactly. The ones that were most aggressive in the persecution, I mean, the, the Sanhedrin, which was predominantly Sadducees, which were Greek-oriented, they had had problems with Peter and John preaching and healing, you know, and not knowing how to do about it. But when the final outburst of persecution, which started with the stoning of Stephen, happened, the indication is that, that those were Pharisees. Saul, for instance, was a Pharisee, and he's the one that got really into it. And they were the ones that were most <laughs> rapidly, you know, the Pharisees, the separated ones. They, and the indication is that the Sadducees who controlled the Sanhedrin, they, they weren't the entire Sanhedrin, but they controlled it, that they sort of stepped back and the Pharisees kind of took the forefront of the persecution, which would have meant the Pharisees hated the, the um, Hellenized influence. The Sadducees were more Hellenistic. The Pharisees were Hebraic. And they hated the Hellenistic influence. And so it makes sense that they would be the ones that would lead the charge and that they would be more oriented toward persecuting the Hellenized Jews rather than the Hebraic Jews. But again, that, that uh, idea is a combination of a lot of little data points. It's, there's no one place where it says, oh, and, you know, the Hebraic Jews were all left alone. Okay? Now, um, so we have the first Gentile, predominantly Gentile church, starting in Antioch. Then we have a little uh, sidestep here in Acts to give us kind of a historical review of what's going on. It was about this time that King Herod, now this is Herod Agrippa I. It is not the Herod, it's not Herod Antipas, the one who beheaded um, John the Baptist. It is not Herod the Great who, tried, who was after Jesus when he was in it. Okay? Herod the Great, his, one of his sons was Herod Antipas who killed John the Baptist. One of his grandsons is Herod Agrippa I. That's this Herod. And he actually, uh, whereas the previous, like Herod, um, uh, Herod Antipas was only tetrarch, means he was the ruler of one-fourth. That's what a tetrarch means. The Romans really liked Herod Agrippa. And so first Caligula, and then Caligula's successor as emperor, they, um, they named Herod Agrippa king over everything. And so Herod Agrippa had almost as much authority over as much area as his grandfather, Herod the Great, had. So this is Herod Agrippa the first. Herod the Great was the builder? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's the one that died shortly after Jesus' birth when Jesus and Mary and Joseph went to Egypt. And then he had a bunch of sons, a couple of them he killed, you know, he had strangled. Um, he uh, had his wife killed and then had visions of her talking to her the rest of his life, you know. Strange man, but an extraordinary architect and builder. Um, and then his son, is Herod Antipas is the one that killed John the Baptist. One of his grandsons is Herod Agrippa I, this Herod. Can't tell the players about a program. You've got more Herods than you. Can't swing a dead cat without hitting Herod. So, so, all right. It was about this time that King Herod Agrippa arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, one of the original twelve, put to death with the sword. When he saw that this met with approval among the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. This happened during the festival of the unleavened bread, which was right after Passover. After arresting him, he put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. High priority target, they would say in the business. Okay? Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. Now... Herod, Herod the Great and all of his descendants were not really Jews. They were not uh, genetically Jews. They were Nabataeans, meaning they were Arabic. They were from Arabia, uh, related to the Edomites. 
You know, so they were never perceived as being truly Jews. Even though they converted to Judaism, they were raised as Jews, and so you have instances like this. It was true with Herod, it was true with Herod Antipas, it's true, true here with uh, Herod Agrippa. They're always trying, since they're ruling over the Jewish people, they're always trying to be uh, better liked. And so in this case, in addition to trying to follow the, all of the, the Passover and all of the festivals and everything else, Herod Agrippa is trying to do whatever he can to ingratiate himself with the Jews who are in authority under him. I mean, you know, they, they're under him, but they still have power. He doesn't want to rebellion. He doesn't want to revolt. And one of the things is he realizes that because of the Jews having persecuted these Christians, maybe he can win points if he does the same. And so he starts out with James, the brother of uh, John, one of the original twelve. This is not the James who's head of the Jerusalem Council later. That James was the half-brother of Jesus. So this, is, this James is not the one who's head of the Jerusalem Council. This is James, the son of Zebedee, the brother of John the Apostle. Okay? He's the first of the apostles who was killed, who was martyred. Not the first Christian martyr, that was Stephen. And then there probably were others that we don't know about in between. Uh, but he's the first of the apostles who died. And Peter is in prison, heavily guarded. Okay, and the church is praying for him. Acts 12, starting with verse 6. That the night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and sentries stood guard at the entrance. Now, usually a prisoner might be chained to one guard. Peter's got shackles on each wrist, chained to two different guards. So he is being heavily guarded. Earlier you saw there were 14 sold or 16 soldiers assigned to make sure he, was, um, he didn't escape. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared and, and the light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up. I love these little details. <laughs> Wake up, Peter. No. Um, Quick, get up, he said, and the chains fell off Peter's wrist. Then the angel said to him, put on your clothes and sandals. And Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me, the angel told him. Peter followed him out of the prison, but he had no idea that, uh, that what the angel was doing was really happening. He probably thought he was still sleeping. It's an amazing thing, by the way, that here he is. He's about to be tried the next morning. Um, James has already been beheaded. Uh, he's, Peter's probably going the same way. He's chained to two guards. He's got, you know, he's the, and he falls fast asleep. He obviously isn't too brought up about this. Okay. Um, some of you have trouble sleeping the night before one of our tests here. You know. <laughs> <laughs> he had no idea what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. They passed the first and second guards and came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them by itself, and they went through it. When they had walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left it. Okay? Yo, yo, you're on your own. Peter. I got you this far. Okay. Miraculous event. All of the authority of the army and of Herod Agrippa, um, Herod Agrippa and everything, and yet the church, the only thing they can do is pray. But this is what happens when you pray. Then Peter came to himself and said, Now I know without a doubt that the Lord had sent has sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were hoping would happen. When this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. John Mark, who is the writer of the Gospel of Mark, who had been, as we'll see later, traveled with Paul and Barnabas, later was the assistant to Peter. His mother was one of the leaders in the church in Jerusalem, and they, it refers in a couple of places. In fact, they met at her home. So this may have been the primary meeting place. It's where Peter goes to when he wants to find uh, the other Christians. Peter knocked at the outer entrance, and a servant named Rhoda came to answer the door. This is one of the coolest little stories in Acts. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed... Did she open the door for him? No. <laughs> she ran back without opening it and exclaimed, Peter is at the door. <laughs> You're out of your mind, they told her. When she kept insisting, insisting that it was so, they said, it must be his angel. Okay, a couple of explanations there. Here they are praying and praying and praying and praying and praying for Peter. And then when he shows up at the door, they don't believe it. 
Sound familiar? Mm -hmm. You haven't been there? Okay. Um, a lot of this stuff is, should be an encouragement to us. And then, when she kept insisting it was so, they said it must be his angel. The belief then was that everyone had a guardian angel, and at particular times, that angel could appear to be you. Could appear in your form in order to do something that you haven't been adequate to do yourself or whatever. And that's what they're talking about. But Peter kept on knocking, and when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. Peter motioned with his hand for them to be quiet, and described how the Lord had brought him out of prison. Tell James, now this is James the brother of Jesus, who is the head of the Jerusalem council. The other James is dead. Tell James and the other brothers and sisters about this, he said, and then he left for another place. This is not where he leaves to go to Rome, because he comes back later for the Jerusalem council. But he leaves for some period of time, some months, to get away from, the, from uh, Herod. We don't know where he went. It was a secret. But Peter leaves. And it's at this point that Peter is no longer part of our story in any significant, in any significant way throughout the rest of Acts. In the morning, there was no small commotion among the soldiers as to what had become of Peter. After Herod had a thorough search made for him and did not find him, he cross-examined the guards and ordered that they be executed. This was the standard thing. The Romans instituted this, and Herod is following their example. Anyone who let prisoners escape suffered whatever punishment the prisoner would have received if they were guilty. And in this case, execution. You will notice later on, toward the end of Acts, when Paul is being taken to Rome with some other prisoners, apparently, and they're on board the ship, they hit a storm, and the ship is about to go down, the soldiers come to the centurion who was in charge and said, should we kill the prisoners? Why would they kill the prisoners when the ship's about to go under? Well, the reason is if any of them escaped instead of dead, then they would be punished for it. If they killed the prisoners before the ship wrecked, so they knew they were all dead, then they wouldn't be punished. Okay? They had a very simple, very clear-cut kind of approach to things like that back then, even though it sounds awfully harsh to us. So here we have Peter miraculously being released from jail, Going off somewhere else, Herod is kind of, uh, how did this happen? Then, yes? Um, I, I'd like some help because uh, I made uh, uh, a wrong guess. I sort of figured the house of Mary, that could be Jesus' mom. No. Because John was, uh, uh, Jesus said, here is your mother. Well, but this is not that same John. This is John Mark. This is not John the Apostle. Jesus said to John the Apostle, Son, here's your mother, mother, here's your son. In other words, she gave them John and Mary, his mother, John the Apostle and Mary, his mother, take care of each other. This is a different Mary, and her son is John Mark, who wrote the Gospel of Mark. It's a different John. In fact, if you go to Ephesus, they have the, the traditional uh, home of Mary, the mother of Jesus. And they had a lot of Marys, too. They did. Very popular name, Mary. Um, and that's because... John the Apostle lived in Ephesus for much of his life. It was from there that he was exiled to Patmos, which is right off the coast, uh, and then came back there. And so it's believed that for the rest of her life, Mary lived there with John. You know, and that they did what Jesus said, and that is take care of each other. Okay, but that's a different John and a different Mary. All right. Um, now Herod gets his comeuppance. Then Herod went from Judea to Caesarea, that's the Roman center, remember, Caesarea Maritima, and stayed there. He had been quarreling with the people of Tyre and Sidon. These are Phoenician cities north of Caesarea along the coast. Remember, this is now part of Herod Agrippa's kingdom because unlike his, you know, his uncle, Herod Antipas, Herod Agrippa is ruler over all of this as his grandfather, Herod the Great, had it. So Tyre and Sidon are under his authority. He had been quarreling with the people of Tyre and Sidon. They now joined together and sought an audience with him. After securing the support of Blastus, a trusted personal servant of the king, they asked for peace because they depended on the king's country for their food supply. They were right on a rocky coast. Well, part of Herod Agrippa's kingdom involved the agricultural areas of the plain of Sharon and Galilee, both of which grow a lot of produce. And so they were dependent upon getting food from those areas. And they couldn't afford to have the king mad at him because they cut off the food, all right? On the appointed day, Herod, wearing his royal robes, sat on his throne and delivered a public address to the people. They shouted, this is the voice of a god, not of a man. 
Immediately, because Herod did not give praise to God, an angel of the Lord struck him down, and he was eaten by worms and died. But the word of the Lord continued to spread and flourish. That last little statement is that no matter what Herod tried to do, killing James, imprisoning um, Peter, no matter what he tried to do, God was in charge. And God's will would be done, and the word of God continued to spread and flourish. Now, this is very interesting because... Uh, Josephus, the Jewish historian of the same period, has an extended description of the death of Herod Agrippa. And it's very, very consistent with this. He says that Agrippa actually had gone to Caesarea for a festival. There's a little bit of difference in there, although not, they're not contradictory. There's a little detail in that. And he says that he was speaking and he describes his robes as being made of silver and shining in the sun like, a, like the, the clothing of a god. And he's speaking, and all of a sudden he has a horrible pain, and he doubles over. They pick him up and carry him out, and five days later he dies in agony. Well, it's not inconsistent with this, and this idea of eaten by worms, some doctors have said that it was very common in those days to have intestinal parasites. All right? Didn't know what they were, didn't know how to control them. And that, in fact, intestinal worms can get together in a ball, you know, in your stomach, and cause an intestinal blockage and cause great pain and eventually death if nothing is done about it. So what we have here and what um, is described in Josephus and what doctors say was quite, quite possibly what happened back then um, are all consistent. But Agrippa dies from all of this. And we're told, similar to Nebuchadnezzar, believing that it was all in, in, in Daniel, believing it was all by his power and his authority and his smarts, that all, of the, that all of this was happening and not giving credit to God. Nebuchadnezzar went insane until he recovered his understanding of Jesus's, of uh, God, rather, of God's authority and sovereignty, and then he regained his thoughts. And Herod Agrippa refused to give honor to God, and so he dies. John? Were they involved? With, with the the Jews would not have been involved. I'm sorry? The Jews would not have been involved, no. Egyptians involved, the Jews would not have been involved. Okay, um, keep going here. Barnabas and Saul, we're going to start talking now about preparation in the first missionary journey, which was Barnabas and Saul with John Mark part of the way. Acts 12, when Barnabas and Saul had finished their mission, now let me explain what that is, we skipped over some stuff. Um, they have a famine in Jerusalem, and so in response to the famine in Jerusalem, the church in Antioch takes up a collection, and they ask Paul and Barnabas, to take it down to Jerusalem so that the church in Jerusalem would have help. Later on, Paul, in his letters, uh, like in Corinthians you know, 9, uh, 1 Corinthians 9 is the fundraising letter because he's asking people to give to help the original church in Jerusalem. Well, the mission that they're on here is they had been commissioned by the church in Antioch to take their collection down to Jerusalem to help the people there. Okay, now they're returning. What caused the famine? Well, they're not really sure. In fact, there's some question as to where was there a famine. It may very well have been that there were various famines that happened, and they're not massive famines. It's not like the famine that drove um, drove Jacob and his family into Egypt or any of that. But there, it was very unstable. They didn't have irrigation. They didn't have, and so there were times in which they would just have bad crops for a year or two, and that meant that things were so expensive. It was very hard to buy food. And if you were really, really poor, you couldn't get food. But it wasn't a famine in the sense of like we think of Ethiopian famines or whatever, where there is no food available. And so it's probably that. That's why the people collect up money, because there was food to buy, but it cost so much because there was less of it. Okay. Beyond that, we don't have details. Chris? But this isn't the same uh, thing that Paul was writing about, right? There was a second time. Well, there are, uh, it was a fairly regular cycle. And again, remember that a lot of the members of the church in Jerusalem were, were slaves. They were uh, poor people. They were people, and they were freed slaves, meaning they were the lower echelon of society. There were a few people that were well to do, women especially, that cared for Jesus and the apostles when they traveled around. But later on, they ran into real straits. And this is the sort of thing that for poor people would happen quite regularly. Economic problems in this part of the world was one of the reasons why people were very open to other religious ideas as a way of getting hope. Not only Christianity, I mean, the, the economic situation and the difficulties of that time with taxes from the temple, taxes from the Romans, people were in straits. 
People uh, were inclined toward Christianity for the hope that it brought. They also were inclined, unfortunately, to some mystery religions and things because that also gave them a, a much more personal sense of relationship to the divine than they were getting from the, from the old gods, the pantheons of gods, okay? All right. Barnabas and Saul had finished their mission. They returned from Jerusalem, taking with them John, also called Mark. Not John the Apostle. This is John Mark, writer of Mark's Gospel. Now, in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. Barnabas was one of them. Simeon, called Niger, which uh, Niger means black. He was a black African. Okay. Lucius of Cyrene, also African. Cyrene would have been what we know as Libya, North Africa. Menaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch. Um, and maybe this is how Luke knows so much about what's going on in Herod's household, is because there was somebody who was part of the church who had, who had grown up with, um, with Herod and still was connected. And Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. The two of them, sent on their way by the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucia and sailed from there to Cyprus. Seleucia is a, is a port town right across from the island of Cyprus, which is you know, right in the middle of the east, eastern uh, Mediterranean. When they finished at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. John was with them as their helper. John Mark, again. Um, let me go back up here and see if I can... Um, that one doesn't do it. Okay, I've got another, another, another map. So, they're commissioned, ordained by the Holy Spirit, sent out by the Spirit. Here's the map. <laughs> other direction. This is Antioch of Syria. Again, the third biggest city in the Roman Empire, a very significant city, where the first church is established, first Gentile church, predominantly Gentile. This is Damascus, the capital of Syria. This is Jerusalem. This is Caesarea, where Herod has just healed over with worms. Um, this Caesarea Marit Maritima. Um, the island of Cyprus, okay? This is, this is the province of Cilicia. This is Tarsus, where Paul is from. So he'd been ministering in Cilicia and I think Pamphylia earlier. So their home base is Antioch. They go down to Seleucia, which is the port, and they cross over to the island of Cyprus. They land on the west side, uh, I'm sorry, east side of the island, and cross overland to Paphos on the west. From there, they go up to Italia on this area here. The whole thing is called Asia Minor. We know it as Turkey. Over here is Greece. This is Syria. Always has been Syria. Still is today. And then down here would be Israel. Phoenicia, Judea, Nabataea, which is part, you know, the east of the Jordan. From there, we're going to read, they go up to Italia on the coast. They travel inland to Antioch of Pisidia. It's called Antioch of Pisidia to separate it from Antioch of Syria, which they just called Antioch because it was a major city. From Antioch of Pisidia, they then go down to Iconia, Lystra, Derbe, then back again, okay? And then they don't go back to Cyprus, they come straight over back to Seleucia and Antioch. That's what we're about to read. But we just read, they left from here commissioned by the prophets and leaders and by the Holy Spirit, and they have traveled over to Cyprus, which was a jumping off point for a lot of places here, okay? Is that clear? Again, this map is online if you want to, want to look it up. Or uh, you can go on, on, you can go to the Google, as we call it, and you can look up Paul's missionary journeys and you'll see maps for all of them. They traveled through the whole island until they came to Paphos. That means they landed on the east side and they crossed the island to Paphos on the west side. There they met a Jewish sorcerer and false prophet named Bar Jesus, which would be the son of salvation, okay. who was an attendant of the proconsul Sergius Paulus. Proconsul would be the local governor appointed by the Romans, and that's why he has a very Latin name, Sergius Paulus. The proconsul, an intelligent man, sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. But Elimus, the sorcerer, for that is what his name means, uh, would be uh, in the Greek, um, Elimus Magus, Magus being a sorcerer, 
And in fact, some translations say, because it doesn't sound like the same name, you know, at first they, they say he's um, Bar-Jesus, then he says Elimus. Some translations say Elimus Magus, for that's what his name was in Greek. So it was very common to have Greek names and Hebrew or Aramaic names as well. Uh, in fact, John Mark is a split name. It's a Hebrew name and a, and a Greek name. Um, then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Alimus and said, You are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. What do you really think, Paul? <laughs> you are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? Now the hand of the Lord is against you. You are going to be blind for a time, not even able to see the light of the sun. Immediately, mist and darkness came over him, and he groped about, seeking someone to lead him by the hand. When the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed, for he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. Now, a couple important things about this. Prior to this, it had been Barnabas and Saul. This is the place where we get introduced to Paul's other name, Paul. Um, and in fact, when it says Saul, who was also called Paul, Luke never again refers to him as Saul. It is Paul from here on out. The other thing that happens is from here on out, it's Paul and Barnabas. Or as you'll see in the next passage, Paul and his companions. Prior to this, Barnabas had been the leader. He was the one that was best known. He was the one that had brought Saul into it. He was the one that everybody looked to, and his name was always listed first. After this demonstration of God's power through Paul, of uh, cursing this sorcerer who tried to deny the truth of Jesus and tried to prevent the proconsul who wanted to accept what they said, from this point on, Paul is the one in authority. In fact, one of the things you're going to see is um, that when they, land, when they leave Cyprus and they go up to uh, Italia, which is called Antalya in the nowadays modern, it's one of the places we're going to visit in a couple of months, um, it's, uh, that's where John Mark leaves them. And some people think the reason John Mark left them may have been because John Mark was Barnabas's cousin. And when Paul takes over, and there's no indication that Barnabas fought him on this, it's not like he took over by force, it's just, it was clear that God was giving Paul leadership role in terms of his authority and his preaching and everything else. And Barnabas accepted that, but when Paul takes authority, that may have been why John Mark, who was cousin to and a supporter of Barnabas, may have decided, I don't want to be along anymore. I'm going to go back to Jerusalem. And he leaves. And that led to a split later between Paul and Barnabas. Yes? Is there any um, reference prior to, to this statement where he is filled with the Holy Spirit? Did, did Paul do anything be, before that for healings or anything? Or is this sort of the, the start of his ministry and he becomes filled with the Holy Spirit at this point? Well, he, I think he was filled with the Holy Spirit. He's been ministering for years, mm -hmm. um, even though we didn't hear about it, Silesia. And we didn't hear about it while it was happening, like in the book of Acts, but, but he refers to some of those things later in, in his letters, Galatians and 1 Corinthians and other things. Um, in terms of... I mean, it said in the previous slide that they were they were directed by the Holy Spirit to go out. So, whether or not he performed other miracles, I'm not remembering anything else that he did earlier than this. Because I think we just had his conversion and then the immediate follow up to that, and you know, etc. So, not aware of anything, but there's every indication because he's been ministering for years and years that yes, he would have been doing because ministry in their perception in those days involved not only preaching but also healing. Was there not a point in time when he was in training, where um, he was set aside to, to train, be trained? And he was not trained by anybody. In fact, Paul said, I, nobody had authority over me in terms of training me. I received my training directly from Jesus. Um, but was there a time when he was set aside and... and mentored by somebody? No, there not, was not. Not mentored by, but... Um, put into the right frame of mind and everything for it does, Jesus? It does suggest that he spent two to three years in the desert, probably praying, preparing himself, studying, hearing what God had to say to him. Then he came back and spent a number of years in Cilicia and Pamphylia um, ministering, you know, and that's when it was from there, he was back in his hometown of Tarsus in Cilicia, that, that Barnabas goes up and gets him. 
Okay, I need to move up, move ahead, guys. Is there somewhere the critical? I, say, I always hate to cut people off, but I just wanted to address what she was saying about okay. being filled with the Holy Spirit. We, we, Anna and I have prayed for him. In chapter nine, it says that that he prayed to receive that regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. So yeah, that well, at that, that occasion. well, when we talk about being filled with the Holy Spirit for performing miracles, remember anybody who professed faith in Jesus Christ is filled with the Holy Spirit. It's how that is then manifest through gifts of the Holy Spirit or miraculous outworkings. That's a different thing. But all of them have the Holy Spirit at this point. Okay? Um, sorry, to, sorry to cut you guys off. I, re, I always want to entertain questions. But I want to get through some more of this. From Paphos, which is on Cyprus, the island of Cyprus on the west hand end of the island, Paul and his companions. You see it? It's no longer Barnabas and Saul. It's Paul and his companions sailed to Perga in Pamphylia, where John left them to return to Jerusalem. This is where John Mark leaves. And this becomes a real bone of contention later, because before the second missionary journey, Barnabas wanted to get John Mark to go with him again. Paul said, absolutely not. He deserted us you know, early in the first trip. I'm not going to take him back. And they had an argument and a falling out. And so Barnabas ended up taking John Mark and going to Cyprus on another trip. And Paul ended up taking um, Silas and heading overland on the second missionary journey. Okay. From Perga, they went on to Pisidian Antioch, that's to separate it from Antioch of Syria. On the Sabbath, they entered the synagogue and sat down. After the reading from the law and the prophets, the leaders of the synagogue sent, sent word to them, saying, Brothers, if you have a word of exhortation for the people, please speak. At which point Paul went, yes. <laughs> Standing up, Paul motioned with his hand and said, Fellow Israelites and you Gentiles who worship God, the God-fearing Gentiles, listen to me. The God of the people of Israel chose our ancestors. He made the people prosper during their stay in Egypt. With mighty power, he led them out of that country. For about 40 years, they endured their, he endured their conduct in the wilderness, and he overthrew seven nations in Canaan, giving their land to his people as their inheritance. All this took about 450 years. Talk about a synopsis, okay? <laughs> but again, he's speaking to predominantly Jews, and so he's giving them Old Testament history as a foundation. After this, God gave them judges until the time of Samuel the prophet. Then the people asked for a king, and he gave them Saul, son of Kish, of the tribe of Benjamin, who ruled 40 years. After removing Saul, he made David their king. God testified concerning him, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. From this man's descendants, God has brought to Israel the Savior Jesus, as he promised. Again, the Jews expected that the Messiah would be, and they had been promised, would be an heir to David. He would be of the line of David to refill the throne of David. That was the expectation. Paul is doing what we keep saying. He goes back to the Old Testament as an explanation for people to understand the importance of Jesus. And he is an heir to David. He's of the line of David. The line and house of David, as it says in, in Luke. Um, before the coming of Jesus, John preached repentance, this is John the Baptist now, and baptism to all the people of Israel. As John was completing his work, he said, Who do you suppose I am? I am not the one you're looking for, but there is one coming after me whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. John was very well known. His ministry was, you know, would have been spread far and wide. Jews would have been talking about him everywhere, even up in Asia Minor. And so he's... He's referred to here, and Paul is quoting him as saying, somebody after me, more important than me, is coming. He's the one to look for. Fellow children of Abraham and you God-fearing Gentiles, it is to us that this message of salvation has been sent. The people of Jerusalem and their rulers did not recognize Jesus. Yet in condemning him, they fulfilled the words of the prophets that are read every Sabbath. Notice he's doing this after they've read from the scrolls here in the synagogue. Though they found no proper ground for a death sentence, they asked Pilate to have him executed. When they had carried out all that was written about him, the whole fulfillment idea again. Um, wait a minute, I lost myself. Now, they took him down from the cross and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead, and for many days he was seen by those who had traveled with him from Galilee to Jerusalem. They are now his witnesses to our people. Now Paul cannot say... Later on, Paul will say he did witness the resurrected Jesus, so he was worthy to be called an apostle. 
But he cannot say, I was one of those people that Jesus appeared to between his resurrection and ascension, because he wasn't. It was later that Paul had the, the, the experience of Jesus on the road to Damascus. But he does say, there are witnesses. We tell you the good news. What God promised our ancestors, here it is again, there's that, that promise fulfilled. What God promised our ancestors, he has fulfilled for us, their children, by raising up Jesus. As it is written in the second psalm, you are my son, today I have become your father. God raised him from the dead so that he will never be subject to decay. As God has said, I will give you the holy and sure blessings promised to David. So it is also stated elsewhere, you will not let your holy one see decay. Now when David had served God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep. That's a euphemism for dying. Uh, he was buried with his ancestors and his body decayed. But the one whom God raised from the dead did not see decay. So God had said, you know, I will not let my holy one see decay. And people thought he was talking about David. Paul's making a point here. David died. David's body did decay. That's not who the Holy One, <clears throat> that's not who he meant. We know who he meant. But the one whom God raised from the dead did not see decay. Therefore, my friends, I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you all. Through him, everyone who believes is set free from every sin, a justification you were not able to obtain under the law of Moses. Take care that what the prophets have said does not happen to you. And he quotes here. Look, you scoffers, wonder and perish, for I am going to do something in your days that you would never believe, even if someone told you. As Paul and Barnabas were leaving the synagogue, the people invited them to speak further about these things on the next Sabbath. When the congregation was dismissed, many of the Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who talked with them and urged them to continue in the grace of God. On the next Sabbath, among the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord, I'm sorry. On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. When the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy. You see this happen a lot. The Jews see such big turnout for the Christian churches, and they get jealous about it. And that leads to persecution. That's also led to persecution between Christian churches. You don't like that you've got more people, you know, and you're coming to your place on Sunday than we do. Um, we, I, I want as many churches as we can get. Okay, and we pray for them all every week. When the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy. They began to contradict what Paul was saying and heaped abuse on him. Then Paul and Barnabas answered them boldly. We had to speak the word of God to you first, since you reject it and do not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life. I love that. You don't think you're worthy of eternal life. That's why you're not listening. We now turn to the Gentiles, for this is what the Lord has commanded us. I have made you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. When the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and honored the word of the Lord, and all who were appointed for eternal life believed. So the Gentiles, the God-fearing Gentiles and others, were anxious to hear that this was for them too. And when they heard, they believed at least um, all those who were appointed for eternal life. Those of you who have problems with predestination can pray about what that means. <laughs> <clears throat> the word of the Lord spread through the whole region, but the Jewish leaders incited the God-fearing women of all people, the God-fearing women yes. of high standing and the leading men of the city. They stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from their region. So they shook the dust off their feet as a warning to them and went on to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. I'm going to stop there. We have... Um, a little bit more that I will pick up with next week uh, in terms of ministry in what we believe are the churches of Galatia. There's two theories about the book of Galatians. The ancient province of Galatia was further north, but when the Romans took over, they usually would reorder things in terms of what they thought was easiest to administer. And they created a province, a new Roman province of Galatia, which included all of these churches. Um, in the book of Galatians, you either think it's the first of Paul's letters, which I do, because I believe it was written immediately after this missionary journey, and he's writing to those churches, or you believe that he went further north in one of his other trips that we don't know about, um, and that he was writing to them. But I believe that these are the churches of Galatia, the province of Galatia. So we'll pick that up next week. Any last questions? We're out of time. I've got like four more slides, but we'll do that next week.
Are you enjoying the story of Paul and Barnabas and Silas? Well, not Silas yet, but all these guys. Okay, good. God bless you all. We will see you next week.